Ladies and gents, welcome back to another video. In front of me here is a 2020 MacBook Pro. This is the Intel model, the high-end four Thunderbolt 3 port model. This was released in early 2020 and discontinued in late 2021. This thing was one of two Apple laptops that has Intel's 10th generation chip. This has a quad core i5 or i7, but we're gonna get into the specs here in just a minute. Today's video is gonna be a quick overlook of the device. We're gonna talk about some of the good things, some of the bad things. We're gonna go through performance. We're gonna test out gaming with Minecraft. We'll do a disc speed test. We're gonna get an overall picture of how this thing holds up here in 2024, and we're gonna decide if this thing is worth it or not. So with that said, let's begin with my specific specs so you know what we are working with. So we'll head up here to about this Mac, and you can see this is the 2.0 gigahertz quad-core Intel i5, Intel Iris Plus graphics. This is the G7 variant, but we'll get into that in just a minute. There are a few nuances with that in Apple's laptops. We do have 16 gigabytes of 3733 megahertz LPDDR4X RAM, and we're running Mac OS Sonoma. I do have the one terabyte solid state drive option in here, and the configurations for that we will get into here in just a moment. Let me pull them up on Apple's website. So here's our MacBook. You could get it in space gray or silver. I have the space gray version. Here are some of the specifications. We'll talk about the display in just a minute. So the options for the processor was what I have, the quad core 10th gen i5. You could also get a 2.3 gigahertz quad core i7. Performance between those is very negligible. They are both hyper thread capable quad core CPUs. So four cores, eight threads both 10th gen chips. SSD configuration started at 512. This is the only 13 inch MacBook Pro to feature an entry config of 512. You could get that all the way up to four terabytes if you really spec this thing out. Memory came with 16 standard and that was upgradable to 32. So another unique thing for this MacBook is it's the only 13 inch MacBook Pro to get 32 gigs of memory. Graphics is the Intel Iris Plus. They don't mention that it's the G7, but it is. The only difference between that and some other models would be the MacBook Air 2020 with the dual core i3. That has Intel Iris Plus G4 graphics, so there is a little bit of a difference there. This has the faster performing graphics. We do get four Thunderbolt 3 ports. That's good for 40 gigabits per second, and that's also how you charge. So on the left side, we've got ourselves two of those Thunderbolt ports, and here on the right side, We've got two more as well as a headphone jack right there. And that said, I think that's gonna wrap up the configurations. Everything else here is just the fine details. Bluetooth 5.0, 802.11ac Wi-Fi. Here are the details for video display output. This thing can do 165 hertz. I am able to do that on my ultra wide monitor. It is 1440p ultra wide at 165 hertz. I believe 2018 and later MacBooks can do more than 120. So that is a unique thing for this computer as well as the other 8th, 9th, and 10th gen CPUs from Intel. Now let's go over the externals of our MacBook. We already talked about the ports, but the keyboard here is Apple's Magic Keyboard. This was the first 13 inch MacBook to get that. And it is much, much better than the butterfly keyboard. It feels like a traditional laptop keyboard. Feels very nice and the keys don't have any issues as you would see with those 2015 through 2019 various models of MacBooks. You do get a dedicated escape bar. You do get the touch bar, which I do actually like quite a bit and I missed that on my 16 inch MacBook Pro. You do get the little inverted T. I don't really care for this as much. I actually like it better when it's the full size but that's just a me preference, and you get a dedicated Touch ID power button up there at the top. Flanking the keyboard on either side are speakers, and these sound average, and I would say if you have an iPad that's like 2018 or later, it's not even as good as the iPad. So speakers are okay, they're fine for a laptop, but they're nowhere near as good as the new 14 and 16 inch MacBooks that Apple has to offer. Trackpad is phenomenal. Apple has the best trackpads in the computing industry. It's a force touch trackpad, very large, it is a pleasure to use if you've never used a force touch trackpad from Apple. Moving up here to the display, it is a 13.3 inch display. I will put the resolution right there above that Nintendo 3DS. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it's like 1440p plus, like a little bit higher than that. It goes up to 500 nits of brightness, 
which is actually better than the M1 MacBook Air. It's on par with the other 13 inch models and the newer M2 and even the M3 MacBook Airs have the same display brightness as this. It is a 60 Hertz panel, so no promotion for this display. This MacBook is very thin and light if you're comparing it to some of the others around this same time period. The 2019 16 inch is a lot bigger and heavier and even the 14 and 16 inch with Apple Silicon are significantly larger and heavier than this MacBook. So this is very thin and light and it feels very similar to the newer MacBook Airs. In fact, it's a very similar size and weight to those computers, but I do enjoy it and I think it's a very nice portable size. It goes basically everywhere you go. In terms of battery life for one of these, I would say it is average. It's enough to get you through a normal day using light tasks. If you're doing any gaming or video editing, that's gonna be a bit of a challenge on this battery, but if you're doing things like email, Safari, spreadsheets, PowerPoint, that sort of stuff, I think you're gonna get like eight to 10 hours of battery life on these. Now it's not brand new, you're not gonna find a brand new one, so they're all gonna be used a little bit and they are gonna have varying battery capacities depending on how used of a MacBook you do get. Now with that said, let's go ahead and talk performance because that is a big downside to this computer if you're comparing it to modern MacBooks. Starting off, we have Geekbench 6. This is a single core and a multi-core score. And single core, we got 1496, multi-core is 4821. So that's actually not too bad. That is about on par with a 2017 15 inch MacBook Pro. It's got that quad core i7, seventh gen. So respectable numbers, but if I bring over an M1 MacBook Air to do a comparison with, you can see right away, this thing blows the old Intel MacBook out of the water. We have single core that is significantly faster and multi-core that is almost double the performance. And remember, this is a fanless design with twice the battery life. So the M1 chip is really amazing. I'm sure you guys are so tired of hearing that because I know I was for the longest time until I actually got on Apple Silicon and I realized just how much better it is. And these numbers are okay. They're not even that good anymore, but if you're not doing anything super aggressive with your computer, you will be just fine. And moving over to graphics, I don't know why I put the MacBook Air away. I'm gonna bring it right back. Here is our metal GPU score with around 11,000. And here's our friend, the MacBook Air. This is the seven core GPU, and that gave us a score of 31,000. So basically three times as powerful here with the MacBook Air compared to this 13 inch MacBook Pro, mid 2020. And now we can officially put this MacBook Air away because next on our list is gonna be a disk speed test. Now this is an area that this MacBook actually performs really well in. So if I open up Black Magic Disk Speed Test, we're gonna read and write a five gigabyte file to that internal solid state drive. So you can see write speeds there are just shy of 2,500 megabytes per second and the read speeds are close to 2,200. So very fast solid state drives and these are basically on par with the modern MacBooks. All right, next on our testing list, we're gonna fire up Minecraft here and check out the performance of that CPU-GPU combo. We're gonna get a feel for the fan noise on this computer, and we're gonna see just how well it runs a very demanding game for a system of this caliber. Minecraft is very resource intensive, and it demands a lot from computers, especially laptops. So I'm gonna get my mouse plugged in and we are gonna fire up Minecraft and we're gonna see how this performs here on our 13 inch Intel MacBook Pro. I'm gonna do my best to position the camera in such a way that we don't have to use a screen recording software. And I wanna make sure you guys have the best experience here watching Minecraft on this computer. So first things first, we're gonna head into the video settings and I have turned that resolution down to half. We're gonna do 24 chunks of render distance, eight chunks of simulation distance, and full screen is on, so we should get a pretty good feel for how this MacBook performs. All right, here we go. Let me go ahead and max that brightness out. It is getting dark on the map here, which is a little bit unfortunate. I am actually going to switch into a new world. All right, here we go. We are in a fresh load of Minecraft here. This is a brand new map for me and we're gonna start by taking off and just flying in a random direction. You can see this is actually very smooth. I'd say we're between the 30 and 60 FPS range, depending on what the computer is currently doing. 
It is rendering the map in pretty quickly. I am able to hear the fans. They are spinning up rapidly once they kind of reach their resting place. I'll move the microphone so you guys can hear what they sound like. But if we're on the ground here as if you would be playing survival mode and just kind of running around, the experience is very nice. It is pretty smooth. There are a few stutters here and there. I think maybe a render distance of 24 was a little bit aggressive, but we're gonna leave it at that just in the mindset of really pushing this computer just to see how well it performs. So if we take off and fly here, one thing I like to do to really test that CPU is kind of do a sprint to the edge of the map and see if the world is able to continue loading in or if we are in fact able to reach the edge of the map and then kind of glitch the game. So I'm gonna go ahead and speed this up and see how long it takes to reach the end or if we're not able to reach the end and the computer can actually render that map faster than we're able to fly. All right, so the computer's doing a pretty good job. We are able to essentially keep on sprinting forever. I know it's just loading in some water right now, but we are not able to reach the end of the map, even though it feels like we get close at times. There we go, there's some more intense stuff for the MacBook to render. We'll see what happens here as we fly over. While we're doing that, I'm gonna draw your attention to the fans as they have kind of reached their terminal velocity here. I'm gonna move the microphone down so you can hear them. So that's how loud they are. They are certainly noticeable here at a normal viewing distance from the computer. And if I were in a quiet place like a library or in a lecture hall for school, this is certainly something that those around you would be able to hear. Now, if you're on an airplane or in a busy coffee shop or somewhere like that, not enough noise to really make a difference, but it is something to keep in mind if you're in a very noise sensitive environment. So that's been a look here at Minecraft. It is certainly playable. I cut the resolution in half, render distance is at 24, and we're getting, I'd say, an average of about 30 to 40 frames per second. All things considered, pretty enjoyable experience, and I could certainly play a full game of survival here on this MacBook without really feeling any resent towards the machine. So enough of that. So we are currently running Mac OS Sonoma. I think we mentioned that earlier. Um, we might even have a software update here, but this computer is gonna get Mac OS Sequoia in the fall, and I have a feeling that's gonna be the last stop for this MacBook. There is a slim chance it gets the Mac OS update from 2025, but my hopes for that are low. I think Apple included basically all of the previously supported MacBooks and desktops for that matter into the Sequoia update as kind of a last ditch or a final push for Intel to give them all one more year and then I have a feeling, maybe with the exception of the Mac Pro from 2019, I think Apple could drop support for all Intel computers in 2025. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I don't think this thing will make the list. There's a slim chance it will because it is a 2020 model and that'll only have been four major Mac OS updates, which is pretty short for Apple given their history. But when we saw the transition from PowerPC to Intel, some of those computers only got a single year of updates after that software came out. So it is certainly not unheard of for Apple to cut support very early for their computers. I think they've kept Intel alive for a little bit longer than a lot of people were expecting, especially this year with the Sequoia update. The fact that they still support 2018 MacBooks and the 2017 iMac Pro, I think says a lot. So I would say you'll get maybe one more year after Sequoia this fall. So let's wrap this up. Should you buy one of these in 2024? I think the short answer is probably no because the price of these is very similar to an M1 MacBook Air, which is significantly better in almost every way. The only reason I could see you getting one of these is if you really need bootcamp Windows support because that is something that Intel does offer that Apple Silicon cannot. That said, Apple Silicon is able to emulate Windows and it can probably emulate it better than bootcamp can run it natively. But there is something to be said about just having it as a completely separate boot drive. And I think that if you really want a true Windows experience, doing it through bootcamp is probably a better option for you. Something else to consider if you want one of these is having those four Thunderbolt ports. If for some reason your workflow is just absolutely dependent on having more than two ports, then you've either gotta spend a lot of money on a newer 14 or 16 inch MacBook Pro, or you gotta get one of these older ones with an Intel chip like a 2020, 2019, any model with the four Thunderbolt ports. 
because the Apple Silicon models like this MacBook here, they only get two ports there. So if you plug in an external display and you've got some other accessories like an external hard drive or something, and you want to connect to power, that is going to be too much for some of those other popular models. But this thing will be able to do that no problem. Some of the compromises are going to be battery life. It's going to be a loud and hot computer. This thing gets pretty warm. Fans spin up somewhat aggressively. And the overall performance of the CPU GPU combo is not very good. Not even close to what the M1 chip offers. So good for very basic tasks. And I think the pricing for these is between three and 500, depending on your specs, which I believe a MacBook Air M1 is essentially $400 now. So if you can find one of these for really cheap, that's in good condition. I, I can recommend it, but if you're really a power user, if you're using Final Cut Pro, or if you really just need all day battery life, this is not going to be the computer for you. So there you have it. That's been a look at the 2020 MacBook Pro. This is the higher end model with the 10th gen Intel CPUs and four Thunderbolt 3 ports. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave me some comments down below. Are you using one of these MacBooks? Are you considering getting one? What are some things you like or don't like about this computer? I'm interested to hear what you guys think. That's gonna do it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in another one of my videos.